Uh, any any questions before we get started today that I can help with? Okay, so uh, if there aren't any questions, then we'll we'll get started. Um, so we'll be working with worksheet six today on integrating factors, and that is. Uh, I believe section 1.4 in the reading materials. Um, so just to start a couple of things I want to just give you guys a chance to talk about. So these were some of the questions that were on the reading quiz. Um, I think everybody had four out of these five. So you had some subset of these, maybe not these exact ones. Um, but we were trying to classify these as whether or not they're linear, separable, so on. Um, so this first one um, is not going to be linear, right, because of this term over here. So we've got the dependent variable occurring to the power of two. And this is also not separable, right, because it's a difference of two things as opposed to a product. Um, for the second one, this one is separable. Right, because it's already basically a product, um, but it is not linear again. Since uh, when we divide by the dependent variable, that's not a linear thing. And even if I tried to move the y minus two to the other side, then I would have a term which is y prime times y. And that would not be linear. So one kind of subtle thing here is when you're thinking about these, you definitely want to think about what is the independent variable and what is the dependent variable, because the independent variable could be not linear, but the dependent variable is the thing that needs to be linear. Um, so in um, for this one over here, um, this one is not going to be linear. You can, uh, excuse me, not going to be separable. You can try it and separate this, not going to work, but this one is uh, linear. And when we say linear, that just means the expression that occurs in front of each of the X's or X primes or whatever does not depend on X, right? And so that's the case um, for this third one. And any questions? Um, then the just first to quickly give you a chance to ask if you want to clarify anything. So for this one, the dependent variable is W, okay, and Z is the independent variable. So this one, um, we've got two two terms that have um, W in them, and the thing that's multiplying each of those Ws doesn't depend on W. So this one. Um, is linear as well. And um, I don't think you're going to have any luck separating this one. For the first homework, you yep. asked about linear and stuff. And yep. I know I got a lot of those wrong because I didn't re understand the concept because we didn't go over this yet. So I was wondering. If yeah, so, so this was in the, it was in the reading uh, material. Okay. Um, so yeah, we didn't talk about it. It was in the introduction, um, but that there was a note in that problem said, hey, check out the introduction to um, check these out. Yeah, so now I just want to review them together since, yeah, um, that was on the homework. Some of the stuff on the homework, um, you might be asked, we might not cover, um, some of it we will. So um, yeah, so hopefully now I just want to clear up this idea when it's really relevant, what is linear versus not linear. Um, okay, and then this last one over here um, is separable, but this one is um, not linear uh, because of this over here, right? We have a y being multiplied by y prime. So just to confirm, um, you can have a function of the dependent variable, for example, the plus three X, 
um, but you just can't have it squared, right? That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you mean for like this one over here you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah, so if you had a, a squared on this term, um, yeah, that would no longer be linear. Okay, thank you. Yep. And Professor, I apologize if I missed the explanation on the one we were just going over, but I thought it had to be uh, the equality of f of x. I, uh, I missed that one because I thought the equality to zero did not fit that form. Uh, for this one right here, or you said this one uh, over here? Correct, yes, sir. Yeah, so you could have a function f of x, which is zero, and that's okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Cortez, do you have a question? Cortez, I, I see your hand, your virtual hand up. Um, so let me know if you've got a question, Cortez. I think you're on mute. I can't tell if you're trying to um, talk. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear you, sorry. Uh, but I had a question just about the homework. Uh, okay, so um, let, what is it? And then it might be something we can discuss together. It might be something I'll say, just hang out afterwards and we can touch on it. But what, what, what's the question, Cortez? It's for number two, um, the graph shows that, or the uh, slope, the slope field shows that it's in terms of y and x. It's supposed to be in t there, like y and t. Because the question uses uh, y prime is equal to sine of y. Okay, I'm just opening that up. On um, question two, uh, yeah, so it has y and in t in the equation, the slope field has a y and an x. Yeah, sorry, that they should just be the same. So you can either change the t to an x or the x to a t, yeah. Okay, cool, I just want Yeah, thank you, Cortez, for, for catching that. Okay, um, so just in regards to the homework, um, they are, the grader is just about done with the, the first homework assignments that you submitted. So you should see those um, really shortly, if not already. I think she was about one or two more to go. But um, I do want to emphasize that I want to see all of your work on these. So um, what I mean by that is if you we're trying to integrate natural log of x at some point in the problem. And you tell me, and this is all of the work that you show, even though this is correct, you haven't shown me how you got this. And so that's not gonna earn um, any credit. So I do want to see the details about how you do it like this. Um, and if you're showing me all these details and you make like a silly mistake where this minus sign suddenly becomes a plus sign, just keep in mind that you won't lose any credit for making like a really small thing like that on homework. Um, so we're more interested in seeing that you've got the right idea. And if you make a careless mistake, we're not gonna um, overly deduct anything or much, but if you're not showing your work, that, that's where some of the point deductions are, are gonna come in. So um, when you're looking over your, your first homework assignment, if you do have any questions or you um, about how it was graded, um, just ask me and I can double check um, if you're curious. But I do want to just show you what it looks like um, when you are looking at your work um, and the comments in, uh, here we are, in Canvas. So here's our Canvas site. And um, I want to check out how I did on homework one. So I can click over here. Um, you might not see this just yet because I don't think these have been published for everybody. Um, but um, let's see. I don't want to read, I want to read. So there's a little link here that says like view rubric evaluation, something like this. Um, and so if I click on that, This is, should see the rubric here. 
um, it, and how things were graded. I don't know why I can't see my grades. Maybe it's because they're not published yet. I think that's the problem. Um, let me read this. And so once they are published, um, I just want to show you what, what it might look like. So um, just to take test student, um, when you open it up, you should see kind of a rubric along the side like this. You'll see your work in the middle. Um, and this will tell you how you did on each problem. So green means all good, red means nothing, and then orange is somewhere in between. Um, and when you do lose points, the grader should be indicating why. So for example, hey, you have to show all your work, you didn't do it. Um, you got the first derivative right, but the second one wrong and so on. So um, I would suggest that a really good thing for you to do would be to go in and try and correct your own mistakes. So the, there should be enough information for you to identify how, how to fix your mistake. Um, but if you have questions about the grading or the comments or anything like that, um, please let me know. Um, any questions about that? Okay, so um, let's take a look at the worksheet for today then. And so the, the point of the reading exercise or the reading quiz was, um, yeah, so with first order differential equations, last time we were talking with how we can solve separable differential equations. Today, we're gonna to talk about how we can solve first order linear differential equations. And so um, it's really helpful before you try and solve it to look at the differential equation, identify what type of differential equation, and then that's gonna help you indicate what methods you might have to solve it. So it's possible that a differential equation is both separable and linear, and then you would have two ways of, of solving. Okay, so the context about where we might run into some of these is let's think about the following problem. So we have a big container. Of a solution. And we've got some stuff going in. And then we've got some stuff coming out. And um, this is like a salt solution. So what I'd like to find is s is going to tell us um, how much salt is in the tank at time t. And we're gonna measure, we're measuring the salt, its weight in pounds. And um, just to kind of mock up the information that we have here, this tank um, initially contains 15 gallons of water or solution. And within those 15 gallons, the amount of salt at time zero is six pounds. So this is telling us like something about the initial setup. And then we're told that um, salt water that is one pound per gallon is flowing into the tank at a rate of two gallons per minute. And at the same time, we've got water flowing out of the tank. In this case, um, it's flowing out of the tank at um, one gallon per minute. So we kind of have the initial setup on the bottom. We have what's flowing into the tank on the left, and then we have what's flowing out of the tank on the right. Okay, so um, the question here is, is this going to depend on the dependent variable and the independent variable? So we are going to set up and then solve what is the model of the differential equation for S? How is the amount of salt in the tank changing with time? Um, and so if you remember when we were thinking about population changes of fish, we were thinking, okay, does this depend on the population of the fish? Does it depend on time and so on? So I wanna think about the same sort of question. And that is, will this differential equation 
in theory, could depend on both S and T, or only one of them. So um, what, what do you guys think? Do you think it's going to depend on time? And uh, if you have any thoughts, please just feel free to chime in or chat in if you prefer. Um, It should depend on time because the solution is entering at a rate, as we know. Uh, sorry, Eric. I, I think I I caught the end of that. Can you, do you mind repeating that? Um, the ds over dt should definitely depend on time due to the fact that we are getting more um, solution into the tank per uh, down per minute. Yep. Okay. So um, that makes sense. Um, Uh, in case anybody doesn't have this worksheet, um, I, I'm uploading it into the chat so you can download it from there. It'll upload in a second. Yeah, so sorry. This is going to depend on time exactly because um, it's flowing out at one gallon per minute and it's flowing in at two gallons per minute. So as time goes on, the volume in the tank is changing. Right? The volume should actually be going up because every minute that goes by, two gallons go in, one gallon comes out. So in some sense, yeah, the volume is definitely changing as time goes on. So that should have some effect on the rate at which um, the salt is changing in the tank. Um, what about S? You guys think it's going to depend on S? Yes. Uh, okay. And why? Why is that? I think was that you, Abraham? I couldn't see. Or uh, as me, Brian. Oh, Brian. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, why? Why do you think? Why does it make sense that it's going to depend on S as well? Uh, because it's one pound per gallon. Yeah. So we've got the concentration of stuff going in is one pound per gallon. We're starting with an initial concentration of six pounds in 15 gallons. Um, so that's less than one pound per gallon, right? So we have a difference. The concentration going in is different than the concentration in the tank. So as time goes on, you should expect that the concentration in the tank is going to change. Um, and therefore, um, that's gonna affect how much salt is flowing out of the tank. Okay, so let's think about how we can set up this differential equation. And so um, next week, just to be clear, um, we are not going to meet on Monday because of Labor Day. Um, so no class on Monday, but we will um, meet on Wednesday. And we'll be looking at um, modeling problems on Wednesday of this week and Wednesday of next week. So we'll just be focusing on applications for a bit before we move into second order differential equations. And so um, this would be an example of like what we would call compartmental analysis. And we'll see today that um, this applies to like a, a problem like this. We can think about compartmental analysis applying to population models, some economic models and so on. So all we mean by that is we're gonna, we have one compartment. That might be a tank. It might be the population in an ecosystem. And within this um, contained area, within this tank, we have some things going in and some things going out. So the way that we can describe the rate of change would be to think about at what rate is salt going into the tank, at what rate is salt flowing out of the tank, and overall the rate of change would take into account how much stuff is going in, minus how much stuff is coming out.
So we're going to calculate the rate flowing in and then subtract um, the rate of S flowing out. And altogether, those two changes are going to tell us overall how this is changing. And so um, with a lot of these problems, it's really useful to think about the units. So if um, S is being measured salt in pounds, T is being measured time in minutes, then the rate of change of salt should be um, pounds per minute. So let's kind of just keep that in mind when we're keeping track of all of our units. Um, but any questions? Okay. Um, okay, so then um, the rate in is gonna depend on, as well as the rate out, it's gonna depend on two things. We can see them uh, up on top, right? This was um, the concentration that's going in as well as the rate that it's going in. So we've got um, concentration That's, sorry, I got jumbled up. And then we're gonna multiply that by the rate at which um, the solution is flowing in. So we'll call that the rate of inflow. And so for us, the concentration that was going in was um, one pound per gallon, I believe. And the rate at which it was going in was two gallons per minute. And if we check the units of this product, we'd have pounds per gallon times gallons per minute. And that would give me something that has units pounds per minute. So that kind of makes sense. And then we can do the same for the outflow. We can take into account the um, concentration flowing out. Times the rate of outflow. And we were told that the rate of outflow was one gallon per minute. And so we need to find the concentration and that should have something that is pounds per gallon. And so here's why it depends on S. Um, so the concentration would be what is the amount of salt in the tank? That's exactly what S of T is representing and that's changing with time. And then we're gonna divide by the total volume in the tank. And keep in mind, inside the tank, we start with 15 gallons. But every minute, two gallons go in, one gallon flows out. So every minute that goes by, we gain another gallon of solution. So we can express the total volume in the tank as 15 plus T. So this S of T over 15 plus T is saying the amount of salt is S and the volume is 15 plus T, so the concentration would be S over 15 plus T. So that gives us a differential equation of the form two minus S over 15 plus T. And so now we see this dependence on S 
and the dependence on T. And if you have um, some questions about this model, um, we'll spend time in class on um, more time on Wednesday, no, actually um, Wednesday of next week going through models like this. So we'll do this a little more carefully and I'll give you some time to work in groups practicing these. But for now, I really just wanted to get to this differential equation because it is an example of a linear differential equation. So it gives us some idea of situations where these might arise. Um, but any, any questions? Plus t in the denominator there. Sorry. Uh, why? Why is it fifteen plus t in the denominator? Yeah. And so if you think about the um, volume, I'll just call this v in the tank at time t. So what the denominator here is representing is the volume in the tank. And so we start off at time t, uh, at time zero, excuse me, with um, fifteen gallons in the tank. And then um, one minute goes by. And after one minute, two gallons have gone into the tank, one gallon has come out. So after one minute, you now have um, 16 gallons in the tank. And then another minute goes by, two more go in, one comes out, so we gained uh, another one. So we were just trying to find a model for the volume in the tank as it depends on time. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep. Anything else? Okay. Um, yeah, and so uh, if you want to kind of play around with this before we solve it, um, that link just takes you to this slope field um, stitcher. And um, I just want to compare like the estimate that we can get using Euler's method that we talked about last time to the exact solution that we'll find um, today. Um, so um, question part C is saying, well, let's approximate just using the slope field, come up with an estimate for the amount of salt in the tank, say 15 minutes later. So I could do this um, tail to tip method and keep adjusting my slope and I'm gonna stop when I hit about 15, right? So at this point um, on the horizontal axis, we're at about 15. On the vertical axis, we're someplace slightly maybe above 25, right? So maybe we can approximate the value at 15 as being uh, approximately like 26 pounds. Uh, oh, you guys can't see that. Sorry. Let me open that up. <laughs> um, okay. So um, as I was saying, this is the slope field for that differential equation. And um, we could use this tail to, can you guys still see that now that I went full screen? Yeah, we, we could use this um, tail to tip method to come up with an estimate for what is the amount of salt in the tank at time 15. So we look at kind of 15 on the horizontal axis and then we can see using Euler's method, we would get an approximation maybe like 26 or 27 gallons, right? Somewhere between 25 and 30. Um, so your, those little applets in GeoGebra are, could be nice ways for you to check your, your work um, on, on some of these problems. So um, based on this, let me just say that we've got like S of 15, we can see is approximately, let's say 26, or around 27 pounds. Okay, so we started with, I think at time zero, 15 pounds and um, no, 15, six pounds. And after 15 minutes, that's gone up considerably. Okay, so um, let's think about how we can solve this more precisely. 
So um, this is an example of a linear differential equation. And again, what it means to be a linear differential equation means it can be, if we're only focusing on first order, it means it can be written like this. So the first derivative of y and y itself um, occur linearly. And the only thing that can be multiplying the derivative or y itself would be some expression that has x's in it, or maybe no x's, but it can't have a y. And um, for any one of these linear differential equations, we can write this in what is called um, standard form, which is below. So if I took the equation above, divided everything by a1, that would put it into standard form. So um, when we're going to be solving linear differential equations, it's going to be really helpful to first put the differential equation in standard form. And the um, first one that I want to take a look at is not exactly the one that we, not the salt in the tank one, but we'll take a look at a slightly simpler one just to motivate the process of how we can solve these. And then we'll take a look at the salt tank. So um, the differential equation down here, uh, that is linear and it's already in standard form. So uh, what we're going to use is going to be some method that um, is called finding the integrating factor. Um, but more importantly, what we're going to do is reverse the product rule. So you can call this method like the reverse product rule. And if you just recall, the product rule says if I have f times g and I want to take the derivative of that product, right, generally it looks like this. And um, if you look at the left side of this differential equation, this sort of has that form a little bit. We have a derivative with respect to y and we have a y, right? So this is like our f prime and our f. And we kind of need to figure out what is the other thing in that product rule that would make the left side perfectly the derivative of a product. So our starting point here is going to be the product rule. So for example, if we were taking the derivative of this product, um, and so if you're kind of curious, that symbol is uh, mu. Uh, I'll say the textbook uses an R to denote this instead of a mu. Um, I'll, it's more commonly denoted with a mu, so I'm going to just use the mu, but just know that your book calls it R. So if I wanted to express the product of these two things, it could be y prime times mu plus y times mu prime, for example. So this left side of the differential equation that we start with, we could actually write this as y plus, um, excuse me, y prime plus two times y. So um, just kind of writing the product rule like this, you can see we have like y primes matching up and we have y's matching up. So it makes sense that this could be massaged into a product rule. And that's what we're gonna try and do. Okay, questions so far? Okay, so we're going to introduce this thing mu. We're going to multiply both sides of this differential equation by mu. So the differential equation we started with is start above. So I'm going to write this as um, mu times y prime plus two mu times y is equal to three times mu. Okay, so again, we're just taking that differential equation up top um, and multiplying both sides by some unknown function called mu. 
So as long as I do that to both sides, I, I haven't changed the equality relationship curve. Okay, um, so in order to make this look like the product rule, we've got our y prime mu. So that part checks out. And then we've got this other term over here, which should match up with this one. So this tells me that this two mu should equal the derivative of something, should be the derivative of mu. So in order to put this into the product rule, we must find some solution to this differential equation. We want to find the function mu so that its derivative is equal to two times itself. And this mu is going to be what we call the integrating factor. So we'll see why it's going to be a factor that's going to allow us to integrate the left side of the differential equation. So here we can separate this differential equation, right, by thinking about mu prime as d mu dx. I bring the one over mu to the left side, um, and then I bring the dx to the right side. And um, let me just say here, we don't need to describe every single mu that's going to work. We just need to find one such mu that's going to work. So um, at this point, I ignored a constant of integration. And we'll include the constant of integration at the very end. So I'll just say at this stage, um, we can ignore the plus C since we just need to find one such function. As opposed to like describing all such mu. So um, if I exponentiate both sides of that previous line, then what we'll get is one such function is going to be mu is equal to e to the 2x. OK, any question? Ah, OK, sorry. So uh, we, we did this box already, right? So this is saying solve that differential equation above, um, which we found to be e to the 2x. And so let's plug this back into the differential equation that we had at up here at this stage. So we had, um, we wanted to find mu and the other side was three mu. Okay, so the whole point was we wanted to find the function mu that's going to make the left side look like something that was a product rule. And so I can now plug in that we have e to the 2x and then my mu prime would be 2e to the 2x by is equal to 3e to the 2x. So all I'm doing now is plugging in um, the expression for mu that we found in the previous step. 
And now you can see that the left side of this differential equation, we have now made it into something that comes directly out of a product rule. So um, that whole left side now looks like e to the 2x times y derivative. If I took the derivative of this thing, you can check that you would exactly get back the left side in the previous step. So um, at this stage, we multiplied basically both sides of the differential equation that we started with by e to the 2x. Um, and that gives us a new differential equation. And now we can integrate both sides of this differential equation with respect to x. And this is an okay operation because again, we're doing the same thing to both sides. Both sides we're integrating with respect to X. So integrating the right side, not too bad. Then on the left side, remember the derivative and the integral, they undo each other. So what we get is E to the two X times what? And that just about does it, right? And so the last step that we typically do is divide both sides by e to the 2x to solve for y. And so here, be careful, we can't just say that dividing C by E to the 2X just gives me some other arbitrary constant because what we're dividing by depends on X, right? And so we want to keep that dependence there. So we're taking some arbitrary constant and dividing it by E to the 2X. Does the, um, the E to the 2X Y like derivative, is that with respect to dy dx or with respect to y because so, uh, the dy the, it cancels out when we just take it with yeah the this this prime is a derivative with respect to x so that when we integrate that with respect to x that that's why they undo each other yeah that makes sense thank you yep um so just to finish this one up we would probably want to write this a little bit nicer um, as something like y is equal to, well, those two e to the two x's cancel out. So we have actually just three halves plus c e. We can just write dividing by e to the two x as e to the minus two x. And this would be our general solution to the differential equation at the start. So <clears throat> the whole key to this process is exactly described right here. It's finding this factor mu that when we multiply the differential equation by mu, it's gonna make the left side into a derivative that comes out of a product rule. So um, let's generalize this for all linear differential equations. So the First step is gonna to be to write it in standard form so that we have nothing in front of the derivative. Then um, we're gonna calculate the integrating factor. And um, this integrating factor came from really this stage over here.
And so we could come up with a shortcut for this by saying we found that mu by first integrating the p of x, which in that case was just two, that gave us two x. And then when we solved for mu, we exponentiated both sides. So that's where the e comes from. So in general, the integrating factor, we can always find um, using this formula right here. That's kind of the big key to unlocking this process. Once you find the integrating factor, then we multiply both sides by the integrating factor. And that puts this side in the form of a perfect derivative. And then we can integrate both sides and solve for y. Um, so I just wanted to go through kind of how this process works and what this factor mu does. Um, but now we can use this shortcut. But I just think that throwing this shortcut at you without motivating it might not make sense. Like, why are we multiplying by this weird thing? And how, why is it that we integrate p and then exponentiate it? Um, so hopefully that example motivates some of these um, processes. So let's try and apply this to um, the salt tank equation that we had way back over here. So we had a, a differential equation, ds dt was 2 minus, um, it was, nope. Oh. Right, so we had a differential equation that looked like this. So the first step would be to put this into standard form. So that would be the standard form for this differential equation. And that would be our p of x that I have right there, right? So the p of x is the thing that is being multiplied to s. So our integrating factor is going to be e raised to the integral of p of x. So we're going to integrate 1 over 15 plus t and then exponentiate that. And again, at this stage, we can ignore the fact that there is more than one such function mu that's going to do this. We just want to find 1. And let's pick the simplest 1 when c is 0, for example. So um, integrating 1 over 15 plus t would give us e to the natural log technically of the absolute value. But again, we just need to pick one such function that's going to work. Um, sorry. Yes, here are independent variables t. So um, our integrating factor here, when I take e and raise it to the natural log, right, they undo each other, and I would just get 15 plus t. So um, this was kind of step one. Write it in standard form. Step two was go ahead and find the integrating factor um, so any questions about how we got mu?
And then the next step would be to multiply the differential equation that we have over here, both sides of it by 15 plus t. And so when I multiply the left side by 15 plus t, just be sure you distribute it to both terms. So um, that's why we have a one in front of the s because the 15 plus t divided by 15 plus t would cancel out. And now that left side we can see is what we would get if we were to take the derivative of the product of 15 plus t times s, right? The product rule would say take the derivative of s times 15 plus t and then add the derivative of 15 plus t, which is one times s. Um, questions? So important here that every single thing in the equation gets multiplied by 15 plus t or whatever that integrating factor is. And now we can integrate both sides with respect to t. The left side, those are gonna undo each other. I'll come up here. So we would get um, 15 plus t times s is equal to 30t plus t squared. And now is a good time to include that arbitrary constant in our general solution. We have to include it right now because when we divide the 15 plus t, it'll be the constant divided by t, which is dependent on something. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So you don't want to just throw it in at the end. You want to throw it in after the stage of integrating the right side. That's right. And now um, when we solve for S, this gives us um, our general solution to the differential equation. Okay, any questions? Okay, that was exciting. We just solved our first integrating factor problem. Okay, so um, the general solution we've got And then um, if you recall, we were also told that at time zero, initially this tank contained six pounds of salt. So if I wanna find the particular solution to the initial value problem, then we could plug in zero for T. And solve for C. So when I plug in zero for T, the numerator is C, denominator is 15. And this tells me that C is equal to 90. So that would be our um, particular solution. Um, any, any questions? And 
um, then some things that we've been thinking about as well as um, like what happens in the long run. Are we going to approach an equilibrium or what's going to be the long term behavior of this solution. So if we were to say take the limit of our solution as t goes to infinity. If we're kind of doing this by the book, you might intuitively have an idea of, of what's going to happen. But right, technically, we try and plug this in, we get an infinity over infinity. So we can use uh, L'Hopital's rule. And instead, take a look at the limit of the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. And um, now the bottom no longer is getting infinitely large, but the top still is, right? And this is just really um, essentially saying that when the power of the numerator is bigger than the denominator, this should increase without bound. So as time goes on, since the um, concentration going in is bigger than the concentration coming out. The amount of salt is going to continue to increase um, forever. In our work, could we say that uh, there's T squared on the top and there's T on the bottom? Or do you want us to use the formal way of L'Hopital's <coughs> rule? Um, either way. But yes, what I, what I wouldn't want to see is just to say this is infinity without any explanation. So yeah, one way to describe it is to do it very formally with L'Hopital's rule. Another way to describe it is more informally um, how you were saying. That's totally fine. Say, so, yeah, because the degree is bigger on the top than the bottom, this thing goes off to infinity. So explanation is just needed. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, so, so you need an explanation, something. Yeah, it doesn't need to be huge, but yeah, just something, um, making it clear to the person who's grading it, how you came up with that answer. Yeah. Um, and so one way that we can kind of see that this behavior is such without actually solving the differential equation is to say, well, as t goes to infinity, the derivative is approaching 2, right? Because that second term is basically becoming negligible. And really what that's saying is that the outflow, because the volume is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, that as time goes on, the amount of salt flowing out is basically zero because it's so dissolved into the volume, which is getting increasingly large. So um, this is telling us that as time goes on, as time gets really large, the salt is increasing by about two pounds per gallon. Uh, excuse me, two pounds per um, minute. So every minute that's going by, we're basically adding another two pounds of salt to the tank. And that's why it's growing um, without any bound. Um, and so just kind of one last thing to mention, and that is um, just to compare this to our our estimate that we had from the slope field, if we actually took 15 and plugged it into our solution, we would get 25.5 pounds. So our estimate was actually really, really good. And if I pick smaller vectors, and, I, and if I have a computer, I can pick those vectors basically as small as I want, that um, these estimation methods are really, really powerful. And um, at some point, you almost can do everything using those estimation methods. Okay, any, any questions about that example? So I, I want to give you a chance to practice um, some examples and um, ask some questions before we all go. Um, since sometimes you listen to someone do it and that doesn't necessarily mean you're able to, to do it yourself. So I want to make sure you're able to, to do that. So. Um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll send you into breakout rooms so you have someone to talk about these with since um, you might have some questions. So let's try and work on A um, in your breakout room. And if you finish up A, then by all means move on to B. And sorry, I skipped over question five because we kind of talked about that on the reading quiz, identifying linear things. Um, let's focus on actually trying to solve them now. Um, so just remember the process, put it in standard form, find the integrating factor, et cetera. Um, yeah, was there a question, Kyle? Yes, uh, there was a lot of uh, stopping and starting while we were going over number three. Do you mm -hmm. mind just going over it from the beginning to end streamlined for us? Because sure. we know where we're headed now and we, we kind of have a, a sense yeah. of where this is going. So I would say um, these steps that I was plotting out over there look like this. If you wanted to kind of generalize it. And so um, what that looked like in this particular problem is, okay, we started with um, this differential equation, which was not in standard form. So step one was put this in standard form and in particular, identify what P of X is, or in this case, P of T. Then step two is find the integrating factor. And in general, that integrating factor is gonna, is equal to that stuff that's highlighted in green. So once you identify what um, P of X is, putting it in standard form, the uh, integrating factor would look like this. And then kind of the most important thing is, well, why do we find that integrating factor? It's because now when I multiply everything by that integrating factor, the left side becomes um, perfectly the result of a product rule. And so um, then you can integrate both sides and then solve for S. Um, so I'll, I'll put you guys in breakout rooms and um, if you have some questions, you know, you guys can help each other out. Let's um, plan to come back at about 12, 10. So take about eight minutes and see how, how well, how far you can go in question A. And then I wanna take kind of the last five minutes to just discuss it together and see if you have any questions. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, so let's uh, compare our notes here. So um, here's kind of the, the steps that I was trying to outline so we can kind of fill in the blanks for each of these steps. So for the first step, it would be put it into standard form. So um, here, right, I would need to take into account that I've got a Z over here. So let me divide everything by Z. And it's important to note W is the dependent variable, right? And Z is um, the independent variable. So that would give me a differential equation, d, w, d, z plus uh, two over z, w is equal to five z squared. So, so be careful that you divide everything by z, including the right side. Now we can identify that our P of Z is this expression that is in front of the W, which is two over Z. <clears throat> okay, any questions about that stage? Um, great, so then uh, we find the integrating factor. So I've got mu, is equal to e raised to the integral, in this case of two over z dz. So that would be e to two natural log of z. And then simplifying this, just be careful about how you use your log properties to simplify. So, um, Right, this is the same thing as taking e to the natural log of z, then raised to the power of two is one way to think about it. Um, or you can think about this as um, e to the natural log of z squared because this two can be brought inside the natural log. 
So in any case, you um, want to write this as e raised to the natural log of something so that we can undo each other. And so our integrating factor, you should have found um, as z squared when we simplify that. So that's kind of the, the most important step there, I would say. Um, questions? If I'm real honest, Professor, uh, you already made it past where we got in our group at number one. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so yeah, that's why I want to give a chance to do it together. And um, we'll be out of time in about a minute, but I will stay on the line and do 6B and record it on Zoom. Um, so if you have to go somewhere, I'll, I'll post that Zoom recording for, for B as well. Okay, so we find our integrating factor and now we're gonna multiply both sides of the differential equation that we had up here by the integrating factor. So I would take z squared times, I'll just write dw dz as w prime. I'm gonna multiply z squared times two over z. So that would give me two z times w, and then I'm gonna multiply z squared times the right side, which would give me uh, 5z to the fourth. Um, and so at this stage, if you're asking what happened, we took this integrating factor and we multiplied all three terms by that integrating factor. And um, it's good to do this and then look at your left side and then verify like, yeah, that does indeed look like it is what we would get if I took the derivative of z squared times w. And um, now we can go ahead and integrate both sides with respect to z. And so on the left side, that's gonna undo the product rule. That's our reverse product rule. And then on the right side, we would get uh, z to the fifth plus our arbitrary constant. And um, then we can divide both sides by z squared to solve for w. Um, okay, so we are officially out of time. So um, if you have any questions about this, um, please stick around and ask. I know I saw one in the chat that I didn't quite get to. So um, just, just let me know. Um, I'll stick around. And if you want to kind of go through 6B together, I'm going to keep doing it. I'll keep Zoom recording just so I can post um, that example as well. And um, we can still start class on Wednesday with a chance to practice this um, as well. Again, if you want some extra practice. Um, so the homework assignment for next week is up. Remember, Monday is Labor Day, so I'm not gonna have it due Monday. Um, it'll be due at Tuesday at midnight um, next week. So you have an extra day for that. Um, and it will include, the uh, assignment has some problems from this section and some stuff that we do on Wednesday. Um, so definitely give that a look. And if we can start class on Wednesday, um, going through one of these just to make sure if you have any questions, we clear it up. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, have a good afternoon. And if you wanna stick around and look at 6B, feel free. If you have to go, don't feel bad. Adios.
Uh, okay, so for those that are still around, you guys are interested in 6B, I hope. Okay, so um, for um, 6B and the same idea, first step would be to put this into standard form by, in this case, dividing everything by sine of x. So that would give us, uh, I'll just write this as y prime plus uh, cosine x over sine x times y is equal to x. So this tells us that in this example, p of x is equal to cosine x over sine of x. Um, so let me just do some scratch work here. So the integrating factor Okay, now it would look like e raised to the integral of p of x, which is going to be a little bit trickier, um, dx. Okay, so please feel, feel free to um, ask if you have a question. Okay, so um, to evaluate this integral cosine divided by sine, um, what could we, what method of integration could we use for this? Use sub. Yeah, so we're gonna do substitution um, on this and we're gonna set u or w or whatever you wanna call it equal to what? Sine. Yep, so we're gonna set the new variable we're going to introduce equal to the denominator. And this is going to work out nicely because uh, dw, therefore, would be cosine x dx. And that perfectly matches the numerator. So when we, after doing that substitution, we would get uh, integral 1 over w dw. And um, that gives us the natural log of W. And then we can replace W with sine. So um, when we integrate that P of X with substitution, we get um, E to the natural log of sine X. And uh, we get this nice, cancellation of E and natural log. So our integrating factor here is sine of X. Um, any questions? Okay, so um, next is we would multiply both sides of the differential equation up here by this integrating factor. So I'm gonna get um, sine x times y prime. And when I multiply a sine times the second term, they cancel. And then on the right side, we've got x sine x. And so that looks great. I think it's really useful to stop and just look at what you have on the left side and make sure it looks like a product rule. Uh, and then we can express that thing that I just boxed in as the derivative of mu, which was sine times y. Where did the cosine x of y go? Uh, so if you were to take the derivative of this, 
right? Using the product rule, you would say, okay, take the derivative of y, which is the y prime times sine of x. Oops. Then um, when uh, you use the product rule, you're going to add to that the derivative of sine, which is cosine times y. So if you actually took the derivative of sine x times y, you would get y prime times sine x plus the derivative of sine x times y. So that cosine is coming from the product rule of taking the derivative of the sine component of that product. Okay. So the reason what's really nice about this integrating factor mu is that when I multiply both sides of the equation by it, this thing that I get over here is should equal at this point the derivative of mu times y. And it does. Um, so if you took the derivative of this, it's good to just check to make sure you get that back. So um, yeah, we're just kind of condensing this sum that we had over here into the derivative of the product. And um, now that gives us the ability to integrate the right, the left side, which had a y there, even if we don't know what y is, we know that the derivative and then the integral are gonna undo each other. So on the left, we're gonna get sine x times y. Um, on the right side, we are going to have to integrate x times sine of x. So any, any thoughts on how we can integrate that? Integration by parts. Yep, we're gonna do integration by parts on this. Um, and we could set u equal to x and dv equal to um, sine x dx. So then du is dx and um, v is the integral of sine, which is minus cosine. So now um, using integration by parts, we're gonna get um, minus x cosine x, that's our v du, uh, excuse me, my uv term. And then we're gonna subtract from that the integral of minus cosine x dx. That would be our integral of v du. So this all works out to um, minus x cosine x. And then when we integrate all of that, believe we get a sine of x. And then we have our arbitrary constant. Um, so, <clears throat> do you mind if I kind of erase, I'll do it, some of this stuff over here, and if you, you want it back in, I can add it. I just ran out of space. Okay, good. So then um, now we would want to solve for y, for example. And um, by dividing everything by sine. So this would give me that y is equal to minus x cosine x over sine x um, plus sine divided by sine is one plus c over sine x. Uh, yeah, and then um, I'll just say kind of the last thing you would want to do would be to take into account that initial condition um, just for the sake of respecting your time. I'll just say that um, that actually winds up being one. Okay. 
I forgot one term in here. Sorry, I left out that plus one. Um, any questions about that? Oh, I had a whole bunch of space over here. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, cool. Negative so, x cosine x over sine x be simplified to negative x cotangent x? Yeah, you could call that cotangent and you can call one over sine cosecant as well if you prefer. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so give the homework practice. Um, and if you have any other questions, just let me know. I'll, I'll stick around. Thank you. Yep.